Hello everybody, we are back for another episode of the Xenthanol IPM series and we've got a good one today, something I have personally been bitten by. Ooh, that, that's a clever pun right there. Uh, but I want to turn it over to the man himself who's got another wonderful presentation for all you growers out there today. So enjoy. Hey everyone, this is Matthew Gates. I'm talking today about Western Flower Thrips and I'm very excited to do so. We'll go over a little bit about their, um, of course, how to treat them, how to prevent them, but also a little bit about their biology so you can kind of understand the enemy that you're dealing with. And in some cases, how it can even be somewhat of an ally, somewhat. So let's get the slide up. All right, so yep, if you go to full screen there, then we should be good. Oh yeah, okay. there we go. Aces, all you, sir. So a little bit about myself. I've been a professional consultant in the space of integrated pest management for about 12 years now. Uh, for At this point, most of the experience that I have professionally is with cannabis, but I also have a lot of experience with peppers, uh, horticultural crops like Gerbera, daisies, and things like this. And uh, I've also worked in vegetables and that kind of a thing, and also orchards and, and tea when I was in China. Um, you can find more of my educational information. In fact, some of the slides here are from YouTube videos that I've made on my Xenthanol YouTube channel. Um, you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram with the same handle, which is at SyncAngel, S-Y-N-C-H, like synchronize, and then A-N-G-E-L, like angel. I have other publications that I've done uh, previously um, regarding integrated pest management of pests in cannabis, particularly not only uh, arthropod pests like insects and mites, but also viral diseases. So you can check those out as well. And I've also been interviewed about uh, the cannabis ban areas in um, California by Nippon Television, which was in Japan. So a little bit I want to start off with would be the evolution of thrips um, and a little bit about their background. So the order, if you wanted to look up literature, research literature about thrips, it helps to know some key sort of terms. Uh, basically their order name, which is Thysanoptera, which is fringe wing. Uh, and you'll see in a uh, diagram later on why they're called what they're called. Cause they have these sort of fringes on their wings that allow them to catch the air in a special way and also prevents them from getting damaged in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. They're very close in uh, relationship to the hemitera. So things like aphids and white flies and cicadas and leaf hoppers and things like that. They have thrips in particular. So I should say it this way, hemitera, many people know have a piercing mouth part that lets them drink uh, plant fluids, usually sap, but also the xylem water channels and also the fruit juices of various plants. And thrips have kind of a stylet sort of mouth part, but they also have an asymmetric mouth part that allows them to kind of scrape plant tissues and then sort of drink up the resulting like milieu that they produce, which is why they have a very specific kind of damage that piercing mouth part insects typically don't produce. Um, and they are very, very closely related. And we think that the reason for, one of the reasons why they look, why they are in fact so similar is because they are closely related phylogenetically. So a long time ago, there was an ancestor that broke off and one group became the Hemitera and the other group became um, thrips as we know them. There's about three, 6,000 plus species of thrips. There's a massive amount, but only a very small percentage of them are actually pestiferous. A few dozen species are major agricultural pests, and the Western flower thrips we're going to be talking about is the most significant one, uh, and is also the one that has most literature devoted to it. Uh, they feed on uh, pollen, they feed on fruits, they feed on leaves and stem tissue. Thrips in general have also been found to be, a lot of them, omnivorous. Uh, some of them are more strictly carnivorous. Some of them are fungivorous, or they feed on mushrooms and fungi and uh, fungal tissue, which is also considered to be sort of their ancestral diet, potentially sort of omnivory, possibly um, fungivory in particular. And thrips are super infamous for adapting to 
new locations, not only getting to them, but also adapting to things like pesticides and plant defenses. And again, the Western flower thrips is very um, in specific popular or popularly uh, researched because it is incredibly good at feeding on a wide berth of plants, um, over 250 species of plants in like over 60 families, which is a, a massive range. And they're able to do this because they have this very robust immune detoxification system. They have also a tendency to seek secluded enclosed spaces. And they like to feel in these crevices, they like to feel things on their body, which is called positive thigmotaxy. So they seek out little nooks and crannies in order to kind of hide out and feed. And this is true for a lot of thrips, but Western flower thrips in particular. And um, they also deposit their eggs into the tissues of plants. And a single female can produce like 200 plus eggs under ideal conditions. So even if you've defeated a bunch of thrips in your area, in your cultivation space, and you don't see anything, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no thrips. And this is doubly so for people who are producing cuttings and then shipping those cuttings to other people. This is also what happens in more traditional, quote unquote, agricultural spaces as well. And I also wanted to say that if you hear me say thrips, but I say a thrips instead of those thrips, it's because actually thrips is a Greek word. It means woodworm. And it's because of that reason, it's not actually a plural designation. It's just Greek. We're speaking Greek right now. We're a derivative of that. So in case you've ever wondered why that was, that is the reason. Briefly, if you want to know a little bit about the history of the hemeteroids in general, I'll just go over it here. I kind of already said most of what I wanted to say, but as you can see here, and I think you can see my mouse, this sort of group is the thrips. This is the Thysanoptera. And then over here you have the hemetera, like your true bugs, as you can see here, the heteropterans, the uh, uh, achinorhynchins, um, and then the sternorhynchins. So these are just two different groups of um, hemetera. The sternorhynchins are like your aphids, your whiteflies, your psyllids, and the achinorhynchins are like your cicadas, your spittle bugs, your plant hoppers, things like that. And so they kind of diverge from a common ancestor very, very early on. And that's why they are so closely related. And a lot of their shared traits can be found in thrips. Here's a great picture of thrips in general. Now, when you encounter thrips, it's not necessarily a guarantee that they're going to be Western flower thrips. And we'll go over some examples of how you can tell something is Western flower thrips over a different kind of thrips. But also, the control measures can sometimes be generalized. So even if you don't find a Western flower thrips or you're not sure of the identification, a lot of these um, treatments that we'll be going over will still be pretty effective. And this is an overall really good picture of what you can see when you're infested with thrips. First of all, uh, their bodies tend to be kind of a sort of yellowish color very often. Not all thrips, but... Uh, these Western flower thrips and chili thrips and things like this have this sort of yellowish tinged body. They are kind of um, cigar shaped. Uh, there's different kinds of cigars in the world, but um, they kind of have like a tapering on their abdomen and a tapering at their head. And it's kind of thicker in the middle. And when they feed, they produce this sort of um, stippling damage, uh, which is like this sort of scraping that they make, like I said, with their mouth parts. And you can kind of see in the violet boxes where this has happened. And you can also see with the red marks, the result of their feeding eventually, which is this liquid black frass or fecal matter that they produce and are often found near when they're feeding on plants. So if you see this sort of scraping damage and you see these yellow bodied insects, and you see these sort of black sort of droplets that if you touch can kind of smear then you're probably dealing with thrips of some kind at the very least. And you can tell nymphs from, from adults, just like with most insects, adults have the wings and the nymphal stages or the larval stages don't really have um, wings at all. You might see wing buds that will become wings in the future in the more advanced um, populations. And these immature species, or sorry, these immature uh, populations 
are also the ones that most biocontrol agents kind of go after. They're also going to be more susceptible to sort of chemical agents as well from that um, perspective. And you can also see here pretty well in this picture that I took um, of the big compound eyes at the head area here. And you can also see these things called ocelli, which are primitive eyes that are found in a lot of insects. And you can see poorly, but they're sort of red colored. And that's one way you can tell Western flower thrips and a few other thrips from other species that do not have the sort of red coloration for their ocelli. Um, this information comes from literature called Invasion Biology, Ecology, and Management of Western Flower Thrips from 2020. Uh, they go over some of the physiological traits that make them so good at what they're doing. Um, most thrips, most Western flower thrips are um, sexual. They have male and female um, populations, but they're, they have a special kind of system called haplodiploidy, which means that females that have unfertilized eggs will make males and females that have fertilized eggs will make females typically and that works out really well because it only means that you need one female to get into a new location in order for a colony to develop and for it to be able to make a, a viable uh, population because the females will produce males which they mate with and then make more females and then the population grows from that um, rarely, however, there are asexual populations where unfertilized eggs make females, and although they can sexually reproduce, they don't necessarily do that because their population is already producing um, adults, or rather, uh, progeny. And this is really important to consider because sexual reproduction allows a lot of organisms to adapt to their environments in a very um, a robust way. So once you get a really good population going, um, all they need to do is encounter some of these rarely asexual populations, uh, mate with them, and then potentially pass on these traits to their progeny. And in that way, you can create a, a resistant population very quickly, um, or rather maybe not create, although our cultivation strategies can affect this. Um, that is certainly what has been seen in the environment. Their temperature ranges are pretty wide. Minimally, Western flower thrips do okay. At 8 to 10 degrees Celsius, they can survive. Their optimum temperature, however, is 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, again, according to this literature. And their maximum uh, temperature is 41 degrees Celsius. Uh, this doesn't mean that they can't exist at a, a slightly higher temperature, but the reason why it becomes a problem is that when they're molting from stage to stage, it, it's a very delicate procedure. And the temperature uh, can be a major stressor in their internal physiology and also in their ability to shed their skin or their exoskeleton. And when that happens, um, they die and they aren't able to reach adulthood. So that's kind of what's happening there. And their maximal lifespan, again, depending on temperature, is two to five weeks. It's shorter when the temperature is higher. It's longer when the temperature is lower. And their native range is Western North America. Their range now though is global. They feed on again, over 250 species. And they've been a pretty invasive global pest since the 1970s, so many decades. There are various ways that thrips are able to um, detect and uh, essentially recognize a potential host, especially these hypergeneralists like Western flower thrips. Uh, the two main ones I have here are photoreception and chemoreception, so light and chemical cues. Uh, many people know this already, but many insects are attracted to yellow and ultraviolet spectra, and this is also true for thrips. Thrips and Western flower thrips in particular are also... Um, known to be attracted to sort of the blue wavelengths of light as well. But they're also able to tell shape somewhat. Um, and apparently they're very, um, they're very particular about floral shapes. As I have here, circular shapes are more attractive than other sample, or sorry, simple geometric shapes, but more complex floral shapes 
are more attractive than simpler, especially rounded floral edges. And this makes sense because Western flower thrips love pollen. Um, a lot of thrips do, but Western flower thrips in particular, and especially females, can get the protein that they need in order to create eggs uh, way easier than they can from uh, plant tissue, of course, or rather, I should say, leaf and stem and uh, cellular contents in, the, in those uh, tissues. They're also attracted to chemicals quite a bit, and the chemical cues are plastic, which means that they can change quite a bit. Western flower thrips have a chemosensory protein in their antennae, and that allows them to bind with various plant volatiles, some of which you might be familiar with, like anisic aldehyde or geraniol, which is, again, something that I think people have found in cannabis and other plants, uh, many kinds of plants, as well as methyl cell silate. Uh, phenylpropanoids, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, of course, uh, very common in cannabis, esters, and also four pyridyl carbon carbonyl compounds are also attractive. And if that wasn't enough, males produce an aggregation compound that attracts both males and females. So this is what you're kind of up against when it comes to thrips. They're literally attracted to the defense compounds that plants make, and they are attracted to um, other compounds that plants make uh, aromatically as well. And when I said that much of the literature is devoted to thrips, uh, I mean it. Um, as we have here from Biology and Ecology of the Western Flower Thrips and making a, the Making of a Pest, we can see here that something close to like 50% of publications, especially recently uh, since the 1990s, has become uh, Western Flower Thrips particular. And I have here that uh, because of their polyphagous feeding and breeding behavior, Western flower thrips is exposed to a broad diversity of plant allelochemicals or defense compounds. Uh, therefore, it must be able to metabolize a broad range of allelochemicals as well as produce inducible enzymes in response to specific compounds. Unfortunately, there is little basic ecophysiology information on the response of Western flower thrips to host plant chemistry. Uh, based on pesticide resistance studies, Western flower thrips has various metabolic detoxification enzyme systems that can help it to overcome secondary plant defenses. Again, many of the compounds that we use to control various organisms, even the natural ones, are based on plant defense compounds. So even if you're trying to grow in a space where and I definitely advocate and support the use of more natural compounds, things that will have low or no off-target effect, things like this. Uh, these are very important for sustainability, and yet these thrips are very good at resisting them. Not only those, but the massively noxious compounds as well. Chief among the systems that they have are cytochrome P450 monooxygenases, which, by the way, humans and many other animals have as well esterases, glutathione, sulfur transferases. These are uh, pretty big in the insect detoxification realm. This generalist herbivore has many allelochemical metabolizing genes that enable it to cope with the diversity of allelochemicals that it is likely to encounter. And you can find more information about that on my Western Flower Thrips pest primer video on my YouTube channel. And again, here are some of those examples. Um, I have here an example of a uh, P450 cytochrome enzyme variant that makes some insects like um, vinegar flies or Drosophila melanogaster resistant to DDT of all things. Many people understand how biocidal DDT has been. And yet uh, these P450 cytochrome enzymes are incredibly robust. Um, we rely on them every day in our lives to, to break down things that are harmful to us and also things that we might even find quite tasty. Um, and uh, so true is it also for insects. And you can see here that, uh, for example, spinosad, which is pretty commonly found um, and utilized for thrips, uh, is actually something that many thrips have been found to, in some cases, as you can see here, the double plus counts as not well clarified. Um, but they do seem to have a resistance to uh, spinosins in spinosad. 
but they're also very resistant to um, numerous other compounds, things that you wouldn't ever want to use in cannabis, um, like, for example, imidacloprid, abamectin, fipronil, and dosulfan. These are uh, chemistries that I've um, had to learn about in the past and would never want to utilize myself. And you can see some of the uh, met metabolic um, uh, structures that have this effect or that are they're able to create resistance and thrips uh, at the top of this table. And uh, from the research that this comes from, uh, which is uh, called um, Insecticide Resistance Management Strategies Against the Western Flower Thrips, Franklinina occidentalis from 2008. They say here that, um, and I'm going to go, I'm going to try to bypass the stuff I've already said here. The major resistance mechanism uh, is cytochrome P450, which confers cross resistance among many insecticides. And that uh, Western flower thrips can lay up to 250 eggs during their lifetime. And these two things, their ability to reproduce very rapidly and also their ability to spread out and uh, specialize on various plants does allow them to have this really massively beneficial effect. I keep hammering this in because I find that um, it's something that is not often uh, talked about and it's kind of overlooked uh, when people are finding treatment options for these Western flower thrips, especially in uh, agricultural spaces. Um, here, from one of my videos here about uh, pests that actually attack their predators, um, I have this example here that is kind of interesting and illustrates how this is onion thrips, but various thrips can attack or repel their predators. He looked like he just popped them with his tail right there. He said, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, this is a real thing that you can observe if you're looking closely enough. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty crazy, right? And that's not even the adult form. The adult form even better at what it's doing and can fly away if it's harassed. So again, uh, and we'll find that, we'll talk about this later on, attacking multiple life stages, especially the developing life stages, is very important, especially when you can't get good coverage for the eggs, which are um, a deposit inside the plant tissue. So adults respond to external cues and are affected by sex, age, levels of satiation, so how hungry they are, and the motivation to um, deposit eggs. And some cues are female specific. Um, they probe in various ways when they're trying to find food. Um, sometimes they'll feed for over an hour. Sometimes they will just probe without feeding at all or trying to sop up any uh, liquid. Um, and I go, and you can find more of this information on my pest primer video. But essentially, this kind of describes at the end here uh, how their mouth parts kind of function and the kinds of tissues that they typically feed on. Um, they also utilize their saliva, just like aphids and other insects that we've talked about on the series, uh, to downgrade or suppress the plant immune system. Uh, salivary proteins, for example, are uh, very instrumental in the digestion of complex sugars and proteins. And they're involved in the extra oral digestion of cell wall components and contents. They literally melt them down with the enzymes that they're produced, like an acid. Saliva activates genes implicated in counteracting plant defense responses. So again, that suppressive effect. Their feeding can induce uh, hormonal signaling, like a jesmonic acid, which is required for the onset of plant defenses, which in turn affect responses to the potential host. The majority of genes expressed in Arabidopsis, which is a model plant that is used for experimentation, um, are jasmonic acid responsive. 
uh, which leads to increased JA concentrations. So an ecometabolic approach comparing metabolomic profiles, so the metabolites that a plant like cannabis can produce, like cannabinoids, terpenes, various uh, compounds like this, of resistant and susceptible plants, identified compounds that inhibit feeding by adult thrips, and Western flower thrips in particular. Some of those metabolites are uh, pyrozilidine, per, sorry, pyrolizidine alkaloids, acyl sugars, which are common in um, tomatoes, for example, and I think also tobacco, and phenylpropanoids. So for those who might be more familiar with some of the chemistries of cannabis, these compounds and breeding for more of these compounds in cannabis could lead to maybe uh, reduced feeding and overall sort of resistance to the thrips, although it might not result totally in immunity. Uh, and there are various things that you can do to battle Western flower thrips. You can, like I said, cultivate resistant cannabis cultivars. You can facilitate natural biocontrol agents and attract them like minute pirate bugs, for example, and other predatory mice that might be in your area. Crop scouting and recording your documentation of them is incredibly crucial, especially because they tend to be associated with seasonal changes, like a lot of pests. A, um, an old English word for thrips is thunderbug. And the reason for this is because they are associated with thunderstorms because of the changes in barometric pressure. Because these very small, very light insects, and this should be a very tired story for everyone who's been watching this series, um, uh, they know what I'm going to say. They're small, they're light, they can fly, so they can get up into the air and they can travel a great distance unaided or partially aided by their own wings. And they can drop down into a new location pretty easily, you know, many dozens or even hundreds of kilometers away uh, in their lifespan. So for that reason, you should kind of pay attention to when you're getting thrips, how you're getting thrips. They can come on on cuttings and they can come on uh, from the wind and also from uh, one of the many plants they might be feeding on as a weeds near your area. A hygiene procedure is useful. What I mean by this is having, you know, a way to sort of, uh, sort of either clean yourself or keep your your plants away from each other, or reducing the potential for um, uh, what we call fomites or, or things that could carry uh, thrips and things like that around. And also, even the production of banker pollen plants for predator mites can be useful. But like we've said earlier, pollen is also a suitable uh, feeding source for thrips. So I find that it's best to have a banker pollen plant system for predatory mites and then also seed those with predatory mites on the onset. You can create mesh screen barriers as well, or rather not create them, but you can utilize them. Uh, there are things called thrips screen, which is specifically meant for thrips and their small bodies. And if you can apply those in an indoor setting or if you can somehow utilize them in an outdoor setting potentially, which might be kind of onerous to do. Um, if it's practicable, it can really uh, help you a lot with keeping them from getting onto your plants in the first place. People have also had a good effect with ultraviolet reflective mulch and UV absorbing nets um, because this plays havoc with their ability to kind of sense um, uh, differences in uh, structures and physical spaces. Um, so micronized sulfur and azadiractin are two chemical agents that can work well against thrips. Uh, you would probably want to use these in veg and not necessarily in flour, of course. But um, primarily, you know, we should consider that the sulfur is useful because the way that it kills the um, insect is not really going to be affected by some of these physiological defenses that we spent some time talking about earlier. Whereas azadiractin, for example, has sort of a, you know, it's a toxin, whereas the sulfur is like burning through their exoskeleton, essentially. <laughs> and yeah, it's very hard to become resistant to that compared to the other one. Uh, Puveria bassiana and certain bacillus species can be pathogenic to thrips. Again, predatory mice like Swirsky or Cucumerous mice are effective predators, and so are minute pirate bugs in the Orias genus. 
Oh, that's interesting. I see that my um, my citation for this is off the uh, screen here. But um, there's a few things that thrips have to do to be able to establish a new location. They have to have abundant resources and unhindered access to them. Uh, they have to have a lack of natural enemies. And they have to have a physical environment that has the temperature and humidity um, and sort of other important things like host plants for them to be able to, to feed and reproduce well. And like I've already said here, uh, phytoceid mites and anthocorid bugs are really good against them. You can also use predaceous nematodes as well when they are a pupil form that drops into the soil or whatever, whatever substrate you're using. And uh, this is an interesting thing. Again, it uh, looks like my citation isn't up here, uh, but you can find this on my YouTube channel. Um, believe it or not, Western flower thrips are actually omnivores too. And if uh, they had their way and spider mites didn't produce their webbing, they would eat all the spider mite eggs that they could find. Uh, here's an example of that in this, um, oh no, I'm sorry. I was tricked by the, uh, by the coloration of the text here. Um, this is from predation on spider mite eggs by the Western flower thrips, Franklinella, Franklinella occidentalis, an opportunist in a cotton agro system, agro ecosystem from 1986. So this is pretty old research, uh, but they were able to show that uh, they were uh, very highly nutritious food sources for thrips, which is kind of interesting to think about. But when the webbing is present, uh, they aren't able to aggress the spider mite population as easily. Uh, so here you kind of have a diagram on the left and the right. Th these are from a, um, a document by New South Wales. And this was about thrips regarding a uh, stone and palm fruit, which is not cannabis, of course. Um, but you can see here that Western flower thrips is represented. And so is the onion thrips, for example. And you can kind of see here at the number two spot on the right, where they're, de they're depicting what the heads kind of look like. You can see that Western flower thrips has these red ocelli or primitive eyes, uh, which also see polarized light. And you can also see the onion thrips, which can look very similar, do not have this sort of red coloration. They have this sort of, you've, many people have heard of like insects having three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Well, thrips have kind of like segmented this. They have a prothorax, which is kind of, as you can see here on the left is number three. And then you have a metanotum, which is kind of like a anterior thorax, but they're all the thorax basically, uh, more or less for our purposes. And you can also see kind of the hairy wings that they have. They have two pairs of wings and they have all these fringes on them. And that's why they get the name fringe wing as a group. And you can see how the abdomen kind of tapers down to a point as well. Um, you can't really see a lot of these uh, differences without like a, um, a microscopic approach and, and particularly one that is very, very, um, very detailed. Uh, but you can see here that their antennae and their prothorax does look differently, uh, typically. Uh, so if you do have access to that or somebody who can do this sort of a certification or confirmation rather, then um, you should make use of that to make sure you know what kind of thrips you're dealing with, especially because cannabis has um, historically not been something that entomologists and agrarians have been able to um, work on. So generally speaking, you should try to disrupt life cycle stages with multiple preventative and curative approaches. Ideally, you would have predatory mites or predatory organisms already in your cultivation area because thrips are massively abundant and ambiently um, found in various plants, both plants that we cultivate and plants that we don't cultivate. So it's maybe not the best strategy to go the security by obscurity approach where you just assume that I won't get them. It's okay. I grow my plants a certain way and it's going to be fine. Um, I think that works really well right up until it doesn't work. And then you have to find some sort of an option for you. Um, wettable sulfur and pyrethrin are again chemistries that will work against thrips, but uh, like I pointed out, sulfur is effective because it basically uh, da physically damages their bodies, uh, especially their exoskeleton, whereas pyrethrin is negative for them because it paralyzes them. 
So that's a physiological effect. And you would want to rotate that out with something else because that way you don't select for that resistance. Predatory mice are also a good example of, of like diminishing those resistances because uh, it's hard to get as resistant to just being eaten. And uh, again, my new pirate bugs are also really good for this as well. You can also physically prevent them, especially indoor spaces with thrip screen where practicable. And you should also try to cull nearby host plants on your, I should say, property. Um, and then also learn the common hosts and if they're common in your area, especially if they're near your property yourself. And that is my presentation. Oh, you're on mute. One always wants to show, right? Uh, no, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I was just saying thank you, Matthew. That was great as always. And I wanted to let everybody in chat know, hey, if you guys got questions, definitely throw them at us. Uh, we'll do some Q&A here um with matthew gates uh we'll we'll keep it on the western flower thrips or thrips in general at first and then we'll probably open it up uh if we have a little extra time to just some general questions um i got one for you though i've got a few for you already we'll get you started off here um you showed a picture of the stippling on the leaves which is a great visual indicator of thrips are there any other insects that leave similar stippling or is it uh, unique to thrips, at least what we saw in these pictures? That's an excellent question. Um, whoever asked that question and if it's you, uh, very good job. That's always something you wanna be looking for. Gold symptoms, star. symptoms, causes can have, you can have multiple causes for similar symptoms. So you should always be looking at things from that lens, whether it's thrips or something else. Uh, personally, I feel like the only things that you, or the, the major things you would kind of confuse Western flower thrips for would be other thrips that have a similar kind of damage profile. Okay. Uh, I have seen people, um, sort of mistake the stippling damage from spider mites, especially if you have a particularly egregious population of them. So if you were just looking at the damage, um, I could see how people would find those to be somewhat similar. Although with spider mites, it's usually... Uh, what I would call like a more true stippling damage as right. like pinprick right. kind of a thing. Whereas um, uh, Western flower thrips is kind of more like a scraping action, a silvering that you kind of see. Um, and, and that's kind of the major difference I would say. And that's just, again, based upon the mouth parts, the thrip isn't as piercing as the mites might be. Uh, it's mm -hmm. more of a chewing on the leaf, leaving different stippling marks there. Okay, just checking that out. And we have one coming in from Peter here too. Uh, can you dunk cuttings in anything to kill eggs or insects? Because I, you know, to add to this, I thought it was very interesting that the eggs can exist inside of the tissue, which is something you won't see even if you expect that or inspect that new clone very carefully when you get it. Yeah, I don't, um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure that there is, there might be. Um, but the, the, the problem is that after oviposition, I think that the tissue of the plant kind of calluses over a little bit, which is also part of what makes it so effective. So it's kind of like a little pocket. And then the, the nymph will sort of, um, well, it'll hatch and kind of, kind of, uh, poke its, itself out of the tissue. So, okay. um, I don't think that there's, I don't think it's a really great way to, uh, to treat them. So it is kind of a vulnerability. And it's one reason why thrips are, again, so, so difficult to deal with. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, that was an interesting one. And two, I kind of, um, you know, for a highlight for people, and I'll give them at the end too, just kind of a timestamps uh, for the treatments that you offered, as well as just an overview of the temp and the reproduction cycle, because that seems to be where people run into an error. And I see a lot of people in chat too. They're having a great discussion, um, you know, about sulfur, uh, for one, a lot of excellent input from people using it. Uh, but as well as the different, uh, chemicals that people can use. Cause again, you kind of, I've always preached or I've seen you preach variety is the key. So they're not building up these resistances there. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm seeing people talk about uh, in the chat, like, um, you know, you have like biorational 
uh, applications, so things that are meant to sort of like increase or, or modulate the plant's immune system um, on also the use of like biocontrol agents or microbial uh, pathogens of insects is also a really great way to sort of um, curtail resistance because that way even the resistant population that's already there um, or is selected for, then they get sort of degraded by something that the resistance doesn't help them with. Okay, makes sense, yeah. Um, and this kind of dovetails onto that one too, is like how many days between spraying for thrips, uh, ideally to get those various life cycles? Because you pointed out three distinct life stages for them in the presentation, and each stage is going to kind of need different uh, timing? Yeah, so for so exact for, for like the pyrethrin as directin or wettable sulfur that I mentioned, um, you don't want to be applying those at the same time as the predatory mites. So what you want to be doing is applying those as like a knockdown and then use the predators because uh, not only minute pirate bugs, but also predatory mites are pretty sensitive to a lot of these compounds, um, which is another reason why I preach the importance of not over applying even the things that are safe or seem to be safe. Um, yeah. Yeah, or, organic does not always mean safe, and that's something the more that we learn about it or anybody learns about organic practices, um, it, it can be overdone too. Uh, some things are toxic. Yeah, I also wanted to say that to answer your question, I like to put uh, a three to four day space, and when I'm ordering predatory mites, I like to make sure that logistically I've accounted for this, that like when they arrive, because you can't like just keep them in the fridge or just keep them in the in a box, you know, in the corner until you're done. Uh, they will die uh, rapidly if you, if you do this. <laughs> so you should plan that you apply whatever you're going to apply as a knockdown pr uh, prior. And of course, you don't want to again use this in flower at all. Um, you especially the sulfur, which I'm seeing in the chat. Yeah, good reminder: don't use that in flower. But when you're um, using it. You know, make sure that you have a three to four day space between the first application of predatory mites and then try to have those kind of work, maybe even reapply them once or twice. Um, and then also verify for yourself if you're seeing the population go down. Um, you have to check for that too. Okay. And, and kind of, um, you know, to continue on that, you, you mentioned uh, Cucumeris, I think Swirsky uh, and the minute pirate bug for beneficial control. Where does the ladybug fall into the spectrum of thrip control? Is it, it does, cute it or is it effective? It's not super effective. Um, uh, I've talked about it earlier in other series, but uh, lady beetles, the most of lady beetles people get, there can be problems with, with getting them commercially. There's ethical considerations about how they're harvested and that sort of a thing, um, certain species. But there's also species that most species go after aphids in, in the traditional sense. Um, but there's also some that are specialists, like there's a spider mite specialist lady beetle. There's a white fly specialist lady beetle. There's even a lady beetle that feeds on powdery mildew. Uh, not a curative, effective approach, but there are such things. But um, I don't really know of any lady beetles that are uh, specialists of thrips. Okay. And certainly I don't know of any that are commercially available. Okay. And again, you know, I ask because a lot of people, that's their introduction to beneficials. They might even know of ladybugs being good before they really grasp the term beneficials. So I want to always, always ask that one for anybody wondering, because that's usually what comes up first. Um, but speaking of bugs, again, I'm, I'm master of segues today. You've mentioned that thrip screens exist, which a lot of us know about caterpillar screens or bug screens for outdoor crops. Thrip screens. I'm, I'm imagining it's got to be pretty small. And when you said that, I kind of like, well, would that be a good solution or second measure for quarantining new clones? Can other things like maybe a spider might escape from that same thrip screen? Or is this really something that might be beneficial for quarantining as well? Definitely. Uh, because thrips are so uh, thin the thrip screen is made to prevent them from being able to ingress through it. And so things that are bigger than them are also not going to be able to get through as well. So when I tell people to use like a mesh barrier, I typically tell them to just use a thrip screen specifically in most cases, because 
what you know what uh what keeps out and filters the thrips will also filter spider mites and of course like mods and things like this the only downside to consider is that there's a there's obviously a reason why it works it's because the holes are small but that also means that airflow will be um may be affected somewhat so that's something to consider okay yeah airflow true that is a very good point because they got to be pretty small holes to get a little fancy setup i I don't know i'll I'll keep working that one in my brain because that's a pretty interesting uh avenue something i haven't thought of there um but out of curiosity too you know again you showed us pictures of the nymph stage which is typically what i remember seeing on my plants when i had thrips this is like the one bug that i've had in forever so knock on wood hope i don't see them again different location so yes um okay but the nymph and the adult does one do more damage to the plant than the other uh equal does it matter uh which one we're seeing on there um i would say that uh i don't think it matters too much because um adults will pretty rapidly make nymphs anyways um I guess I guess I would say that uh, if you're growing with cannabis, I don't think that there's. Um, well, I'll put it this way: when thrips are in the immature stage, that's when they that's when they pick up a lot of the viruses that they're known to um, uh, pick up and, and be able to transfer transmit. And so, I guess presumably, and then they carry it throughout their lifespan. So, we don't know very much about the cannabis virome, uh, but you could ostensibly have a population of thrips pick up a virus like tobacco mosaic virus, for example. And, uh, then, you know, those populations will become adults and then they'll move on to another plant and then maybe transmit that, um, that virus. There might be other viruses, uh, that affect cannabis, for example, that we might have to worry about, like what I was saying with the silver leaf white fly earlier, and also maybe even certain aphid species, all three of those groups, thrips, white flies, and aphids are, uh, like the three biggest groups that vector plant viruses. And that was something that caught me off guard. Um, I didn't see a lot of immediate damage to the plants. I didn't see, um, you know, less yields or anything of that nature. They weren't, uh, an attacking force. Uh, there's just, you know, there were a few vectoring though. That is what I underestimated. And I think that's something that I'm glad you mentioned it because, um, that was the real damage. I underestimated them because, again, sometimes it might not be damaging to the plant, but if it's vectoring something, that can be the issue. Um, so tobacco mosaic virus is one thing. Um, what what else can they vector or have they kind of known to vector around the cannabis industry? Or, I mean, does that make sense to me? They're less of a plant physically uh, from their chewing than the actual viruses they can spread? Yeah, so like kind of like with the aphids um, and even sort of spider mites for that matter, like you can have a pretty prodigious population of like hundreds on a plant. Of course, it's not going to be cosmetically appealing. Um, you know, you're going to have potentially damage and, and fruit drop in like other crops and in right. cannabis in particular, you know, this is going to be a problem for, you know, nurseries and stuff. But um the, again, the cannabis virome and research into it isn't very well studied. I'm personally not sure which ones, um, thrips or Western flower thrips in particular, will be able to vector to cannabis with uh, great confidence. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that um, intellectually honest answer. But I, I would not be surprised if they become a problematic vector in the future or if we find that they are more so in the future. Right. Yeah. There are still things that are undiscovered here, uh, that we know, even though the, it does seem to get the majority of the studies, uh, here, a question from chat, um, about white flies though. It says, what is good for white flies? Got them on the last grow, almost done flowering, but so had to let them go. Uh, the spinous ad worked on the veg, but yeah, again, that don't put that on anything flowering. So I guess part one of that question What's, what's good for white flies? Yeah, some of the things that are good for thrips are also good for white flies, like the predatory mice I mentioned, Kakumaris and Swirsky, um, several of the chemistries I had mentioned earlier, like wettable sulfur, acid, or actin, um, 
I, I don't want to be a broken record. I mentioned those a lot in these um, series. Uh, Botanigard, or well, that's a product name for Bouveria bassiana. Um, you can also utilize um, uh, Isaria fumosorcia. So, so, so those intimate pathogenic fungi are also effective, if a bit pricey and expensive. Mm. You also have to be sort of cautious about your source for some of these products because um, they might not be uh, produced in a way that is going to um, uh, sort of, um, I guess, uh, uh, allow or, or keep the virulence factors to be um, present. So you might have a less effective biocontrol, depending on where you're getting the source from. You know, I, I do wonder sometimes when I see um, some of these products on like Amazon, you can reorder and, you know, there's been stories of people just kind of white labeling or making their own labels and slapping stuff on colored liquid. So mm -hmm. uh, going going to the source is always good or having a reputable source too, uh, even better. Um, you had mentioned kind of about spectrum and lighting that the thrips were attracted to more of a blue spectrum or that that's one of the things they're attracted to. Was that kind of in the ultraviolet range or would say running like a, a blurple light versus a full spectrum white light next to it? Would the thrips enter and say like, Hey, what's up blue? So a funny thing about how uh, insect vision works is that, they don't have a camera eye like we do. And um, it's sort of unclear whether or not they even see necessarily a certain species. It's also very, very diverse, right? Um, whether they can see different wavelengths like we do. Like for example, if the intensity of light is cranked up, then they might still see that high energy form more you know, kind of like how a white light in the dark or like the moon kind of works. So mm -hmm. I think that if you have a light going in general, uh, they're going to be attracted to it. And I don't know if blue will be especially better um, than another light source necessarily. And uh, I think that it is actually the case that the, you know, what essentially works as like cones, I don't think they have them in the same way that we do. I think that ultraviolet blue sensitivity is kind of together. Um, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's, it's not as cut and dry as like, they're just, yeah, headed over to the blue light. Um, again, trying to always trying to find those little cheat codes in life. We always Definitely. Look for them. Definitely. Yellow, uh, sort of is the, is the king of, of insect attracting spectra, I would say. Okay. Now, now is thrips the reason why we use the blue sticky cards? Yes. Okay. Typically. Okay. So those are more effective. I mean, I'm sure they'll go over to the yellow as well, but the blue just seems to attract them more. Okay. Supposedly. Um, in my experience, I just want to say that, and it's not the, it's not representative of the total thrips experience and, you know, literal PhDs who have spent their entire life researching thrips might know better than I, but I have found that yellow works pretty good as well and perhaps just as well in a lot of cases. So don't feel too bad if you aren't able to get the blue color. Okay, and that's good because there's a lot to be said for practical application uh, and experience in the field. So that is great to hear there. Um, we, you know, we talked about a lot of things that you don't want to do in flower. What do you do in flower if you, you're, you're past the point of it forming buds and you, hey, I've got thrips. What, so... Think about, I, I like this question. Um, I like to use those predatory mites the most. That's my basic answer to that. And you also might consider utilizing uh, stradiolalaps or hypoaspis soil predatory mites as well, because what will happen is, and this is also true, also not in flower, but I like to use those because they'll get into those nooks and crannies that thrips love to, to inhabit, and including also like the, the flower itself. Uh, one of the, one of the, um, how do I put this? Uh, I guess one of the advantages of like a thrips infestation versus like some other ones, like with, uh, with aphids, like if an aphid infests, like the floral tissue, uh, the honeydew it produces and that sticky substance and everything, you know, that becomes a problem and it gets sooty mold and 
other sorts of things like that. It can really foul the flower. Um, certainly, thrips can also foul, foul the flower as well, but it's sort of less egregious a lot of times. They also like to be on the undersides of leaves quite a bit, but as you can see from the photos, sometimes they'll be on the leaves and they'll even get into the flowers, but those predatory mites will also um, to also follow them into that area as well. Okay. Um, and when they pupate, when the thrips pupate, they will uh, fall into the substrate, and that's where those soil predatory mites and also predatory nematodes become really useful. And um, okay. if you aren't using those in veg, you should definitely be using those in flower to sort of um, increase the the um, the antagonism <laughs> towards that life cycle <laughs> uh, production. And, and, and how would you get those? Is this something that you would order from the same beneficial insectary that you're getting everything else from? Uh, or how would you introduce uh, like the nematodes, say, to your, to your soil? Yeah, um, I would say that there's a lot of commercial um, distributors that will apply sort of the similar, I, or I would apply the similar sort of um, points that they have in the other, other videos, which is, Go for the insectaries that actually produce their own um, cultures mm. of biocontrols. And a lot of those also end up producing nematodes because um, nematodes are some of the earliest biocontrols that were um, that were made in, for this sort of commercial structure. Okay. Now, what, you know, here's, here's another question because you said, you know, they love the kind of the crevices, the corners, the dark places in your indoor areas. You're in between grows. You've cleaned everything out. What are you doing to your grow area, your tent? What uh, type of chemical you're using? How often are you applying that? How often are you waiting before you go back in? and restart in that room if you had a just nightmare thrip infestation you mean like if you cold everything yeah 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 let's say you know farmers starting over it got too bad or they just suffered with it and harvested and now they're <laughs> waiting to reset the room so what, what oh, would be okay. best practices and maybe some of the materials in that case because again it sounds like they love the crack crooks and crannies uh and those aren't always the easy places people get to yeah, so I'm imagining, for example, a like uh, like an indoor home grow sort of tent. For yeah, example, yeah, grow tent is like a this. perfect example. Common. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, if you're in that situation, and, or, and this would also be true in like a greenhouse. Basically, um, I know that in commercial settings and also in home grow settings, this is true, where um, thrips can like when they pupate, like I was saying, they have a wide temperature range and mm -hmm. they also exist in places that have a real winter. Um, mm -hmm. What will happen if you're, if you're resetting and it's also very cold, if you're growing in a place that gets exposed to the cold, maybe not snow or anything like that, then they can kind of sort of go into torpor and sort of rest essentially um, until uh, it gets warmer. But when it gets warmer, they better find some food or they're going to die. So if you're in a space where it's not cold and you cut all your plants down and you're wondering when you should apply or what you should, what you should do, you could apply some of the compounds that I mentioned earlier as well and kind of, or, or just simply sanitize and clean the space. Um, you can also heat up your environment too, or you can just keep plants away for a few, for what I would say would be like a couple of weeks because okay. uh, assuming that you don't have any plants in your house or something that they could feed on. Uh, again, just like these other insects, they got to feed on living plant tissue. They can't feed on tissue that is not basically, uh, you know, supple and juicy. Um, you know, like even fruits they could also be on, for example, like strawberries and, and stuff like that. So uh, if you wait a few weeks, like anything that has either um, sort of eclosed out of pupation and as an adult walking around trying to find plants and doesn't find plants, it'll die. And at that moment, I would also take the time during your reset to take a, a look at your general property area. Um, you know, just look if there's thrips on those plants that you might have missed. Because, you know, weedy plants can erupt out of the ground pretty quickly. So if you're not being vigilant, then that can be a safe haven for them to come back out of. Okay. You're creating a banker plant uh, of problems, essentially. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. And and here now, and again, because I don't use the predatory mites very often, is humidity an issue with them? And this person's asking, uh, is there one, a predatory mite that likes low humidity? Most of them seem to say high humidity. And does that even matter? So the reason why humidity is such a big deal is mainly to do with the eggs, also their bodies as well, because of um, just kind of like how um, sensitive they are to desiccation. This is also true for other arthropods, but uh, uh, the main thing is their eggs, um, because the a good benefit of biocontrols is that if they are feeding on a lot of pests, then they're getting the proteins and nutrients they need to make eggs or to reproduce and make eggs. And um, if those eggs desiccate, then you only really get one generation. And that's not going to be super effective. But if you're getting multiple generations that the predators outdo, uh, then that's actually the superior way to do it. A lot of these mites actually do okay or are from places with very desert-like environments, like Egypt, for example. In fact, Eliahu Swirsky uh, found a lot of the uh, predatory mites that we know now commercially in uh, Mediterranean hot, dry climates. Uh, and they survive well in microclimates that are kind of more humid. But yeah, if you can allow it to be like over like 20 or 30 degrees or 30% humidity or even higher than that, and everything's okay and you're not battling other sorts of pathogens like powdery mildew, uh, then that's going to be, of course, more effective for them. It's going to be a, a better environment, but they can certainly survive in, in hot, dry climates naturally. And yes, uh, usually 30 per, sorry, I was muted there. Uh, I caught myself though. Uh, but yeah, 30% humidity. If somebody's down that low in their grow, that's another issue that they need to address as well. So they've got to get rid of that. Um, and here's kind of another temperature related. You talked about their, their preferred zone, but we also know that, you know, their pupa can fall into the soil, as you mentioned. Uh, and this was asking, can you thermocycle your soil to kill any eggs or pests that were left after culling and resetting? Um, cause I know a lot of people will go out and they'll re-amend it and they kind of, yeah, thermocycling, composting, get things back into shape. Yeah, so also on top of that, I know that uh, commercial vegetable greenhouse growers like um, in uh, the Netherlands, for example, and also other places will allow their greenhouses to heat up quite a bit. Uh, and the reason why they do this is so that they can kill a bunch of the pupae and other sorts of like, um, you know, sort of like these hibernating sort of, um, you know, resting stages of insects that might be in on or around their area um, if that makes sense so absolutely you could thermocycle your soil or some other substrate and uh, nuke them okay good deal it's always funny too because usually when i see a question i'll stay on it in chat and then uh, I'll, I'll get that to you and then i'll scroll down and i'm like didn't i just say this yeah <laughs> he says if it's lower than that you're gonna have a problem anyway so oh it's always great when uh, you get confirmation so thank you there spartan we definitely agree on that one um and everybody yeah you know please keep the questions coming uh we've got a little bit more time here uh if we like and if you're available still matthew i appreciate as always your time so thank you very oh, much definitely this, this episode, I can actually go a little bit longer. So I'm Excellent. definitely here for the questions and answers. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. And Greens Goddess is, is mentioning tonight, there is another show with London. Yes, we are having a special uh, Women's Day presentation with London at 5 p.m. right here. So definitely make sure that you guys stay tuned in for that. Uh, we've got some really awesome guests. We've got some awesome growers. And I say growers because that's how I see it. Sean T. Yep. Happy Women's Day, my ladies. Uh, my mom's my favorite grower. Right on. That's awesome. Uh, thanks, Fried, Goddess. Fried Piper asks, oh, not asking me, so sorry. Maybe you're not interested in my opinion here, but... Uh, well, let's let's get it anyways to, here. With regards to Persimilis, <laughs> yeah, have you ever released Persimilis mites? Um, which you did spell wrong, but only slightly. Um, you know, so persimilis mites are for spider spider mites specifically, uh, just for anyone who didn't know. Um, and that's also kind of a good question to ask about predatory mice in general. Um, there are many kinds and there are different designations that we've given them over time based on 
like the environments they come from and the things that they eat. And there are various types in a commercial setting. And you can look this up. The type three mites uh, of phytoceidae are the ones that people worry about. So like I said, cucumbers and Swirsky and things like this, because they're more generalists. They'll go after things like white flies and thrips and broad mites and russet mites. But or, um, persimilis will specifically go after spider mites and their kin. More bang for your buck there. Uh, let's see here. Cheddar Bob had a question. Or no, wait, it's Cascadian grown. Sorry. Um, how does aphid honeydew differ from plant guttation? Um, or is it a similar? A, a lot, a lot. It's uh, well, well, the source is different. So um, guttation in plants is specifically when um, the sort of usually at least it's the xylem water channels. There's pressure in the plant, right? Um, and this can happen a few different ways, but basically the traditional way is that the in, um, when day becomes night and then becomes day again, there are changes in atmospheric pressure and also changes in like the water content loading into the plant. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that the water will sort of evert out of the stomata. And that's when you get these sort of gutation droplets. And this is actually a very common way for pathogenic microbes to bypass basically all plant defenses and get right up into the tissues because the stomata is just an opening and it, it opens out of the, the xylem water channels that connect down into the roots. And so the droplet comes out and it's still held together because of pressure, um, hydro, maybe hydrostatic pressure, I might be wrong there. And then like things can get on in and around that droplet and then uh, it gets sucked back in. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's how gutation works. Wow. And honeydew from aphids is like gutation in that it's a droplet that's produced from the anus of a of a aphid or a similar kind of insect, and that is full of, oftentimes, um, uh, sugars that have been processed through enzymatic action. Um, also other waste metabolites and also microbes from the intestinal tract of the aphid, which can go on to have uh, immune system suppression effects and other things on the plant, even when it drops down onto the leaf tissues, because it can get, again, like we were saying earlier, it can get into the stomata or it can just, um, you know, just be full of chemicals that kind of uh, act like uh, plant hormones and things like that interesting so it's almost like a bug foliar sounds like yeah kind <laughs> of yeah a bug foliar. Yes. um and going back to the ground uh how about is diatomaceous earth a good deterrent preventative or cure for thrips i think that it's not very good for thrips because basically they are super mobile and aerial um it's not to say that if a thrips were to um, try, try to cross like a diatomaceous earth line that it wouldn't be negatively affected because it would be. Um, but uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're uh, sort of, it wouldn't be a, like a traditionally uh, hard counter maneuver to use it, if that makes sense. Okay. Hard counter maneuver to use it. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just looking here. Um, attracted the aromatically and that's just kind of a terpenes it's weird because you said you know a lot of times we think of terpenes as being natural defenses for plants they'll let those out to detour things but they can actually in the case of thrips be the attracting factor um it, it, now is it like the actual terpenes from the cannabis or was there something more or different that they're going after different uh aromatic um trigger or cue there Oh sure. So um, there's a there's a, a bounty of um, of aromatic compounds that they can be attracted to. Um, several of them are those volatiles like sesquiterpenes and monoterpenes and esters and things like that. Um, I mean, they can metabolize these compounds. I think that and thrips are super diverse, right? But for Western flower thrips in particular. I don't think that they count on those metabolites necessarily for like defense themselves, kind of like how a, like how a monarch uh, caterpillar will feed on milkweed 
and then the alkaloid toxins in the milk are also uh, monarch butterflies will do this too actually they'll they'll feed on wounds believe it or not but they'll feed on those compounds uh, and then they sequester them in their bodies and then they become toxic i don't think western flower okay. thrips has this relationship okay uh, where they where they depend on on those compounds being in their food um, but they're easy they're able to easily sort of uh, digest and metabolize them Okay, no, that's that's interesting, uh, and it kind of goes into this next question here, which kind of sounds like a it's a it sounds like a pretty fun hypothetical, um, but the question is is if in that drop, and again we're talking about the honeydew or the gutation entering the stomata, uh, but if in that drop are Blueberia bassiana endophic in, you can read the question there. Oh, sure. <laughs> Can it <Yeah>. protect? <laughs> I think the like... question is, um, uh, if in that drop, if there's Buveria bassiana endophytic in plant, can, can it protect against the insect? And uh, it's a good question. I don't necessarily know if it'll work in all cases. I've definitely read research where endophytic Buveria, so Buveria bassiana is, an, is a fungus that kills uh, insects as a part of its life cycle. And also it has evolved to have a very close relationship with various plants, especially grasses, um, but also other plants too. And it can enter into the plant tissues and colonize the plant tissues through the roots, the stems, through the leaves even. And in some literature, uh, Bouveria can subsist in a plant for quite a long period of time, many months. Um, and, that, and supposedly in some literature, some insects are actually repelled and either they feed less on the plant and in some cases they get a little bit of tissue in them and they will be killed by it oh, wow. and in other cases they just straight up for reasons we can't totally characterize they'll just repel they'll just not feed on the plant <laughs> uh, i think i saw some literature on leaf miners for which this was true okay. um, and so it's, it's a fascinating subject i'm not sure that uh thrips are sensitive to this though uh or... they might be killed by it but they might not be sensitive to it until they start feeding if that makes sense yeah yeah you know it's uh, <laughs> uh i was gonna make a bad reference there but yeah i get that uh how about this one will neem seed meal in the soil deter thrips um like from foliar feeding i'm not sure i, I don't imagine think that would be the case necessarily Okay, yeah, I imagine because, you know, only part of the life cycle or life stages is in or near the soil. So even if just treating that, it's not going to solve the entire issue, correct? Yeah, and I think that um, it's important to recognize that the reason why these botanical products that are toxic to insects uh, work is um, well, the reason why they might not work, you take the same compounds found in plants, and like I was saying earlier, they can just metabolize them. So why do they work as, as pesticidal agents? Well, it's because the concentration is so much more massive that it, it overmatches their physiology. It's too toxic. The dose makes the poison, right? And so if you apply this neem seed oil or neem seed substrate into the, pl into the plant substrate, and if you're relying on uptake and sequestration to work, I don't think it'll be at a ratio that will matter too much. Whereas if you apply it as a contact kill right. at a higher degree, I think it's actually much more effective this way. Okay, that makes absolute sense there. Death by a thousand needles there. Okay, uh, if concentration makes a difference. And Sean T was curious here, how long do Swirsky mites live? And again, this is on the assumption that they have... Uh, material to eat correct oh yeah that's a great question um i do have a video that goes over some of the lifespans of certain predatory mice i think in the context these were spider mite killers that i'm remembering um oh also for broad mites i have a video on broad mite biocontrols and i can't remember off the top of my head for swirsky or kukumras for that matter but i think it can be several weeks uh, if they have adequate food source. And I think that they are, they're way more fecund on pollen, on a pure pollen diet. So they'll reproduce many more times. Um, and I think also, so there's a predator cost for, for hunting, right? You have to seek out the prey. You got to wrangle the prey. You got to eat the prey. 
and you got to expend a lot of energy to do that. Whereas they can just eat the pollen that's just sitting there and get a lot of the same nutrients. So if they're in an ideal circumstance, I think they can last a lot longer than they naturally would. Also higher humidity, right? Right. And now I've, I've actually seen some people using these around their garden, using pitcher plants, and those kind of emanate a smell. They have an odor that might be attractive. Now they're not the same as a predator might. They're stationary. They can't go out and chase the thrips. Um, but would like sticky trap carnivorous plants catch thrips? Would they be effective uh, as a solution or would they be more of an add on if they're at all effective? Yeah, I don't. I really don't know. I would suspect that they wouldn't be super effective, if only for the fact that thrips can be, uh, they can just pr reproduce really quickly, and so I'm not sure if um, they would be as attractive. Because in a lot of cases, what makes pitcher plants attractive to uh, various insects like flies and things is like either a sweet scent or a special aromatic compound, and then the insect can't move up the um uh up the uh the the, the tube essentially the opening right. and i think if i remember i was talking to marco and i think he was letting me know that it's actually there are actually like hairs or spines or something that kind of like are down and so like like a barb kind of, on a fishing hook exactly kind of yeah kind of like that almost like scales like a okay. like shark thin scales and so they're all moving in one direction and they can't like go up it. it's very smooth um i think that's how it works so basically long story short i don't think that they are um super effective against western flower thrips okay um, as a control well and that's a good person they might to catch talk some, to though they might catch <laughs> some though yeah. yeah right yeah they'll kind of they'll, they'll lure a few in and you know there's there's always the the idiots law there there will be a few idiot thrips that will find their way down the hole um but yeah but do no. you want to make that selection pressure do you want to kill the dumb ones maybe you don't idiocracy of the insect world i wonder if it exists Oh, uh, but no, I good person to talk to because uh, Marco was definitely one of those people that uh, I was talking to and learning from in regards to the pitcher plants and just kind of having them around. I thought that was cool. He's into all kinds of awesome, awesome alternative solutions. Uh, and that's Marco, Brian and Marco show uh, for everybody watching. You know, we do those every Wednesday on the Future Cannabis Project channel. Uh, that is 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. on the East Coast every Wednesday. I'll be hosting that. Well, I produce that one again. We'll be there tomorrow for that. Uh, and, you know, again, we've got some things going on tonight. London is back with the International Women's Night tonight at 5. That's in just a half an hour's time away. Um, but want to give everybody... Oh, and tomorrow morning, too, I saw up here... Chris Guerrero, Guerrero Grows, uh, 10.30. looks like he's trying to fire up the Smoking with a Homie show. And uh, I saw Cheddar Bob, who's also a host on that show, reply that he might be getting a tattoo. And to that, Chris Cheddar, I say get the tattoo live on the Future Cannabis Project channel. What would be cooler than that? So I'm just throwing that out there, guys, if you're still listening. Uh, the chat, so I'm going to chat um sort of opined that it would probably be a great idea to formulate sticky trip strips with um i'm gonna pre i'm presuming they meant terps uh, that they love and actually that's true the blue sticky card ah. traps there are some that um have an aromatic compound as well applied to them or there are people wow. who have used i think almond extract i think there are some uh, ar aromatics if i remember correctly that people were utilizing, um, but I don't remember the specifics. But uh, that's an excellent point, and yeah. it's really a good idea to have a multifaceted trap. You know that that because uh, a lot of times insects aren't going to be as attracted to one or the other in a vacuum, but both a good color that's like the plant they're looking for and ar aroma that they're going to be attracted to, those things will synergize and be more effective. And here I actually see uh, comfortably numb. Uh, he he did say carnivorous sticky or sticky carnivorous plants. I just jumped in there with pitcher plants. Um, 
but yeah, there, I imagine there might be a few different varieties, and probably same principle applies though, uh, in, in terms of the overall answer of effectiveness. Um, somebody also asked about uh, using insect frass and how this has um, stopped uh, thrips and fungus gnats from being a problem, and why that might be the case, or if they're just simply lucky. Is it uh, you know is it is it uh, correlation and not causation? Right. Um, right. Well, uh, I guess it would depend on the frass that you're talking about. But generally, people are using frass for a few reasons. The one for anti-pest, in my experience, is typically uh, because the frass will um, it'll stimulate the immune system of the plant because um, it has compounds in it that the plant recognizes as basically problematic. Or potentially problematic and so certain signals are basically uh, created through that recognition and that can prime the immune system for a few hours or a few days um, how long that lasts will depend on a lot of factors that is going to be very difficult for you to assess in the field but that could be what you're looking at especially if you're doing it very often but uh, i wouldn't expect that to like totally uh, make a plant sort of immune to the to the pest so if you didn't do anything else to them and you're seeing nothing anymore, consider that there might be changes in the ambient population. If you did other things, maybe those are having an effect as well, uh, sort of in concert. Okay. Again, it's all about kind of the segment here. And, and I'm trying to interpret this question. I'll just put it up here and then nine, we'll, we'll probably need more clarification on exactly what you mean here. Um, Captain Jax, let me get you the cool bubble here. It says, segment is about thrips. Yes, absolutely. We're talking about thrips, but we're talking about any insect or uh, IPM issues. If you guys have questions, that's what this man is an expert of. Uh, but he says, if so, what is wrong with Captain Jax if it's found in the wild as organic? I'm not, I've seen Captain Morgan's in the wild. Is Captain Jax found in the wild? <laughs> yes. Um, Do what, what particular Captain ingredient? Jack and and yes. uh, pluck off a Captain Jack's fruit. Yeah, <laughs> Jack. There are there are jackfruits. Be careful. There are jackfruits. There are jackfruits. Uh, that is true. But yeah. No. What what specifically uh, chemical or uh, agent are you talking about there? And then hopefully we can get that in front of uh, Matthew here to to lend his expertise to it. Um, let's see here. There's another one I was going to put up, so I'm not even going to go change this little bubble here. Um, I use Captain Jack's. Is this Spinoza? Uh, Let me just check that really quickly. Okay. Oh, Jason. Spinoza. Hopefully that's the answer. Hopefully that's what he's talking about to you in response to this. Uh, but yes, also I want to mention too, I was seeing that in the chat, Hota Herbs Grow and Tell, uh, which is every Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the FCPO2 channel. It looks like this week they were going to be talking about phosphorus. So if you guys love deep dives, kind of like we're doing here, we're doing deep dives on IPM, different issues. There's a lot of things that you could cover but we're lucky enough each week to focus on kind of one thing. And that's what Jason or Hota Herb does as well over on his shows Thursday evening. But he goes into a little bit more nutrients, minerals, different types of things and different theories uh, for the plant. So again, it's all, all the big picture here. We, we don't try to override you with it. We like to break it up. And uh, let's see here. So spinosa is the active ingredient. Um, okay. So like natural and found in the wild. Well, so spinosa is made from spinosins. And there are various spinosins. And um, spinosins are produced by, if I remember correctly, bacteria is, is actually where those are sourced. So various products that use like spinosa they're using spinosins from these, this, this source um, in, in a great concentration. And uh, there are basically there, there are cry proteins. Actually, let me just make sure that I'm saying something correctly here. 
Okay. And yeah, and it sounds like just in, in general question too, because Captain Jacks is something that I've heard a lot of people and seen people in the forums using. Um, and he's just saying just kind of in a general sense that he's been told it's not good and was more or less well, wondering why uh, on more of a granular level, which I, you know, I don't expect you to know off the top of your head, but it seems like that was kind of the basis of, of the question there. And just curious why people are saying Captain Jax is unsafe and probably somebody in chat may have input on that too. Well, so I think that the, the major reason that that comes about is from, um, is it's just because uh, in some cases, the spinosins and things like that can be sort of problematic for people who are sensitive to them. Um, the other thing to note is that, like I said, actually, I think it was in my presentation that uh, specifically for Western flower thrips and, and other insects too, they can develop a resistance to those spinosins. Um, okay. And uh, the cry proteins I was talking about earlier are actually from some, a different microbe, which is why I was getting those confused. And let me, yeah, because he actually had mentioned uh, BT there, and I had written that one down. Um, kind of with my questions with beneficials. Uh, I wish I could remember the first half of it, but was, was BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, effective against thrips as well? Uh, I think that it can be. Um, the, the, I wouldn't really count on them as much as like the, the fungal entomopathogens as much because okay. I feel like they're much more, well, they're definitely much more adapted um, to sort of like the, the traits that we would care more about, which is sort of a more aggressive sort of germination and infection uh, than the Bacillus thuringiensis, at least for thrips. Okay, right. Again, everything is, is dependent and specific. Um, and then kind of another kind of question or brand product here uh, for Peter. Do you like any of the Marone products, which is something, again, uh, I haven't used myself, but it's something that I hear a lot of people using. So have you had any direct experience or uh, secondhand experience with that, Matthew? Definitely, I have. Awesome. Which ones do you like and for what? To be honest, I... Um... I don't generally, there's a whole group of um, biorational, uh, I mean, they call them biorational pesticides, but um, these sort of like systemically acquired resistance uh, or immune system priming uh, substances. I'm a big supporter of them, but I find that like they have to be utilized in a very specific manner. And a lot of people don't do that um, and then they say that they're not effective and it's because you didn't use them appropriately, but also because they don't, they don't work like other, other sort of pesticidal agents work. They're not a direct damaging thing. And I think what a lot of people misunderstand about them is that they're, they're definitely not meant to be a sort of a direct contact kill like these compounds that people typically utilize. It's meant to be in complement to uh, a holistic multifaceted integrated pest management approach um so when it comes to recommending like these products from different places i think that they work well but you really have to spend the time to actually use them in the right context and in either in response or in much much more importantly in the prevention of uh, specific kinds of pests that you might be dealing with and if you don't do the due diligence, then you're not going to have a, a good effect. And it's probably not worth it to like buy them in that case, if that makes sense. It does. It makes, you know, it makes sense in the fact that, you know, read the directions uh, and make sure that you're applying them at the, you know, the right time of the day, the right temperature, the right amount. Um, all of those will make a big difference. Again, you know, I always talk about, or I always ask you about lady beetles. And, you know, again, that's the, the thing that people gravitate to at first, but we know that's not really as effective as you think it is. So, yeah, um, use it correctly. And at that same time, when I am spraying these, whether it's from like a hand bottle or a cool little uh, mister, should I be wearing any type of PPE? Do I need to worry about um, inhaling any of this stuff? Should I take precautions or is it, uh, you know, safe as water? You should always take precautions. 
Always wear your PPE for all the products. I, that's just my general opinion because especially ones that have like a label and, and this is especially true. This is centuply true for people who are growing in a commercial setting. Uh, the, yeah. the document on the label is a legal document and uh, you can be held personally liable uh, asking the people who are employing you if you don't use them effectively or appropriately. So that's my, that's my professional opinion on that. If you're using other products too, I think it's also a good idea because you don't know how you're specifically going to be sensitive to any number of things that most people aren't as sensitive to. Uh, allergens and physiological sensitivities are much more uh, variable uh, than we have often given them credit for in the past. And um, these uh, procedures are written in blood. Yeah, and the, you have to have them. I mean, even when I was working commercially here, every application, every spay, spray that you performed was supposed to be logged, was supposed to be written in a book, was supposed to be recorded, wasn't supposed to come out of a bottle with use this written on it. So yeah, make sure you follow those precautions and take it upon yourself to do them. Uh, not everybody will volunteer you the right equipment. Uh, and, and I don't know um, if there was anything that made this particular product special or if they're just asking for kind of a, a general opinion on it. Um, are you familiar with Sufoil X? Or is that yeah, something I'm familiar used? with it? Okay. Now, yeah. is there anything that differentiates it from other products? Uh, or is it another just kind of a brand name along the same lines or same active ingredient? Oh, I, I mean, um, it's, I mean, it's definitely similar to some products, but, uh, I would say like a lot of these sort of, a uh, sort of oil based products, it's, um, the formulation is going to be somewhat unique compared to others. And, um, knowing that it's mostly for like the suffocation of these various pests, like that's the mode of action, right? Okay. So some of these toxins, they're effective because they uh, paralyze the insect or they you know, interfere with some physiological process. Whereas things like wettable sulfur or Sufoil X, for example, um, they uh, suffocate or destroy in some sort of like egregious way the, the, the insect biology. So in those ways, uh, again, it's kind of hard to become resistant to them. So they're great to rotate in various things, but Sufoil, X in my experience can have problems if you over apply them or um, if you don't apply them correctly, you can damage your plant certainly. Uh, so you got to be really careful and read how you're supposed to apply them. Um, and if it were me, I wouldn't take chances with applying them with like the equipment that they don't say that you should apply with or <laughs> if you start to play around with the, um, the uh, uh, ratios when you're mixing it and things like that. That's uh, not something that you should do. Yeah, and that's another thing that I hear a lot from people too is, you know, can I mix this? Can I mix that? And then I can get both of my applications done at one time. And I know the answer is it depends, but generally speaking, uh, is there a, a ratio of most times not or usually okay? Uh, what do you say I, there? I like to tell people that um, if you're using something you haven't used before, it's way better to apply it alone first and also at a lower uh, rate than maybe is the typical curative rate. Uh, that's common to do in general so that you sort of test for photo or phytotoxicity. Okay, smart. Yeah. And, uh, and then you can experiment with mixing it with other things. And that's actually one of the benefits of a lot of compounds is that, uh, or other products, you might be able to apply two or even three together but as you create that complexity, it's going to be more circumstantial. Okay. I see uh, P Peter is battling aphids out there. He knocked them off with the hose yesterday, and today he's going Cobra Kai and showing them no mercy. So go get them, Peter. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually a great example of how you could use, an, um, well, a very particular chemical approach, just water, um, and you're physically disrupting them and, a lot of these insects are not very well adapted to like, you know, getting up after being kind of harmed in this way. The, the soil or the ground is um, kind of a very uh, unwelcoming place for a lot of these organisms, kind of like how like uh, 
you know, some animals like monkeys and trees, you know, if they go down onto the ground, it can be very lethal for them. So they stay up in the trees, right? right? That kind of a thing. Yeah. Now I know, you know, I, and I have uh, a lot of your websites and the uh, ways that people can find more information, more awesome education from you down in the show notes. But I think St. Bernard's observation booth just came up with your like million dollar viral video right here for your next IPM video. Just go Aussie style with IPM, bust out the straw, and start snorting the bugs. That'll go viral. I swear it's going to go viral. So he is probably right. He, he is. He's probably right. And he'll probably hit you up for 10% of all royalties. But uh, <laughs> hey, let him have it. <laughs> well, now I have to find I, now I have to find an approach that's going to be similar but different enough that that won't happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh shoot, that's funny. And yes, the the infamous story he's referring to is Ozzy Osbourne snorting snorting a line of red ants, which sounds crazy, but so was Ozzy. I'll buy it for a dollar. <sighs> All right. Another another great episode, Matthew. Thank you very much for your time today and chat. Everybody was awesome. I very much appreciate that. And uh, a lot of good feedback, a lot of good learning and sharing going on. And that's what we come here to do. So uh, bless you guys. I appreciate that. Uh, and, and for you guys, anybody catching us at the tail end of the show, uh, if you go back to 10 minutes and 30 seconds in, you can kind of get an overview of the temperatures and the reproduction cycles of the thrips, or western flower thrips, and that is important to know. That's going to be a big equation of your IPM strategy to deal with them. And also at the 34 minute mark is where uh, Xenthanol put out some treatment options for you. So whichever way you want to go, Video's got you covered. Um, I want to give Matthew Gates the floor right before we go to give any shout outs and places uh, people can find you and things you're going to be doing. But don't forget, folks, coming up in 10 minutes, London is going to be back here with the International Women's Day, and he has got a stellar lineup of growers to be chatting with. So let me turn over the floor once more to you, Matthew Gates. Uh, let people Let people know. <laughs> So there's a few places you can find my work and also support me um, professionally. You can make inquiries to xenthanol.com, uh, where I do a lot of the work in my consulting with people in professional capacities and commercial settings. Also, I will help people in home growth settings as well. Uh, it's very important to me that uh, people get good information, especially because it can be very costly to make a simple mistake. You can find my content also on uh, Zenthanol, uh, the YouTube channel, where I post most of my content about pests and IPM. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at SyncAngel, S-Y-N-C-H-A-N-G-E-L. And I also have a Patreon if you're interested in getting um, quick, uh, helpful hints or clues or information. As little as $1 a month, you can join my Patreon, which also gives you password to my, or you get, gives you access to my Discord channel, which has been growing quite a bit lately. So I really appreciate the support. Uh, and that subsidizes a lot of these uh, sort of outreach um, events that I make. And um, I'm very happy to see more and more people um, become aware of the pests and the responsible ways in which you can treat them, especially with right. biocontrols and things like that. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Chad, for your brilliant yeah. emceeing. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. And and like any good MC or club, we're going to be like, one more, one more bouncer, one more. So we're going to throw in one more from Illa822, who actually had an awesome question earlier. Uh, but, it, uh, you know, Marco and Brian are the best people to answer that question tomorrow. But we've got one more. And this is something that I see pop up a lot, too, um, because a lot of synthetic growers, you know, we like the idea of microbes. We want to use them. But all we're told is that it's going to kill them. Don't bother mixing A and B. So the question, uh, will there be a synthetic nutrient line that can go alongside with, uh, organic without killing the microbiology in the soil? Uh, necessarily, yes. Technically, the answer to that question is yes. But um, some microbes are going to be more sensitive than others. And um, like some, some mutualisms, like with mycorrhizae, there's literature out there you can research. And also on my YouTube channel, I go over that, where 
uh, mycorrhizal relationships are reduced or stunted in places where the plants are actually getting an adequate or super adequate amount of certain nutrients because, well, because those symbioses cost resources even for the post plant, like the, the plant, also the mycorrhiza. So when the plant doesn't need it, its sensitivity to these relationships go down. So certainly applying synthetic uh, um, or just various fertilizers in general can definitely change the microbiology in the soil. That's just one example. Some things are super great at uh, existing even in uh, hyper augmented soils mm -hmm. and others are going to be super sensitive. So it really depends on the micro. It does. And we'll, we'll get into maybe behind the scenes or later the um, two largest microorganisms that have been found recently. One has been in space. The other's been by a tree. Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, we'll get to that another time. Uh, thank you for taking that last question. And again, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, we're back. Get a bathroom break. Grab a drink grab something to snack on uh but i want to close it out with this genetic memory farms ethanol have a good evening sir much appreciate the information as always and that's the sentiment from chat so until next time hopefully uh in two more weeks we will be back with another ipm zenthanol series episode thank you, you very much yeah thank you very much <laughs> all right all